Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, all of you should be looking at something that looks like this. Uh, it's our studio in an internet browser. Cancel this chat for a second. Um, and if you go, so you'll see there are some files in this uh, folder. Um, okay. Uh, uh, some, sometimes they can take a little bit long to load, um, but I'm just going to move forward. And not only will this lecture be recorded, but I have all of my notes annotated that you guys can look at if need be. Um, so here are, the, here are some files that come associated with this little instance of R that we're all using in the cloud. And there are two files of interest. Um, one is, so they're, they're both preceded by tidyverse underscore one. So this is an R script. I'm going to click it and it's going to load. And this is, this is the main script I'm going to be looking at today. Um, and basically, this is just R code. Any line, any line that's preceded by a pound sign, R does not run this. If we want to run a particular command, we highlight it, and we press this run button up here. Alternatively, uh, this is one way of writing R code. This, when I'm like first analyzing data that I've like never seen before, I typically, you know, have things a little messy like this. Um, you can have things very clean, like this R markdown file, which I'll click and open. And this is cleaner because the text that I use to annotate my notes, it kind of wraps on the screen that it doesn't spill over and we have to like, you know, scroll sideways. So that's kind of nice, but also it delimits these code chunks that we can press play and run them right here. So these are two perfectly valid ways of coding in R. Uh, and I'm just going to use this simplified version here. Okay. So um, as always, you know, we can set our working directory to make sure that we're in the right place that we think we are in terms of loading files and saving files. Um, I'm not going to run this because we're currently in the directory that has all these files, which is, which is what we need. So in the previous workshop, um, Danielle gave a basic introduction to data structures in R, but today we'll be talking about this tidyverse package, which is actually uh, a collection of packages that contain tons of useful functions that you'll need for you know, downloading data, cleaning data, analyzing data. Um, and these functions have intuitive names that kind of do the thing you expect them to, which is also very nice. And you know, just, just to let you know, you don't necessarily have to analyze your data using this, this, this tidyverse code, uh, but it's kind of, it, it's rapidly become the industry standard for people to use tidyverse within R because it produces code that is just extremely easy to read compared to other approaches. And I'll show you these other approaches and how they can look a little messy. Um, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, tidyverse has many functions and you can see them all in this cheat sheet here. So if you copy and paste this into another tab in your web browser, um, that's kind of like a brief overview of some of the functions we'll use. I've already done this, so I'm going to click over on this tab here. And um, so again, lots of functions. It might look a little overwhelming. That's, that's totally fine. Um, and don't worry about memorizing all of these. So we'll go through several of the, the more important ones, um, especially regarding reshaping data and filtering based on rows and filtering based on columns. And you know, as you analyze data yourselves, you can quickly find you know, what functions you might need to use by just referring to this cheat sheet. I, I really like these cheat sheets because the functions are kind of categorized based on, um, based on subject. So for instance, all of these functions in this box here are all related to kind of reshaping data. Also, I mean, Google works wonders. If you Google the word tidyverse accompanied with what you're struggling with so many times, like one of the first three links has like basically the solution I need. Okay, I'm gonna go back to our studio. 
So um, in this particular instance of R that we're working with, um, tidyverse is already installed. So I'm not going to run this command, and I have commented it out such that if I try to run it, nothing's going to happen. Any text that's preceded by a pound sign, R does not run. Um, I will run this. So even though we've installed tidyverse, I want to load it. So we're going to run this. It's going to do a little bit of thinking. Um, and we load packages using this library function. Um, you can also load it by going over to this window pane over here, and you can click this packages tab, and you can scroll through and you know check all the boxes of the packages that you want to load. Um, I personally prefer this way. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Many of the tidyverse functions operate on some type of data table. And at the end of the previous workshop, we introduced a data frame, which is essentially a table that has you know, rows and columns. And the columns had some type of informative name, like replicate one, replicate two, or, or sample one, sample two, et cetera, something, something like that. Uh, and uh, when we use functions within tidyverse, we're actually not going to use a data frame. We're going to use what's called a tibble. Um, which is basically a table that's really similar to a data frame. It has a few differences uh, that I'm not going to really discuss because they're not super interesting. Uh, all I want you to know is that when you see the word tibble, that's basically just a data table. Uh, nothing really all that fancy. And um, so for the next two workshops on Tidyverse, so this one and the next one, uh, we will grab data um, from different sources. And again, I like this exercise because you know, a lot of times scientists have to download data from separate locations, uh, clean these data, and then combine them into one bigger table that they can analyze everything together. And these are all common tasks for all sorts of scientists. So even though we're gonna analyze some data from the New York Times today, this is, uh, this is very fresh data on mask usage in the US and also uh, case counts for uh, coronavirus infections. I just thought it was kind of like a timely data set to, to analyze. Even though we're analyzing data, these functions are applicable to basically any two-dimensional table where you have rows and columns. Um, okay, so let's let's start by loading our data. But before we load it, like uh, I typically like to just take a peek at what these data look like. So I'm going to go to this terminal tab. You don't need to follow me, but um, I just like kind of seeing what the very top of this file looks like. And so here I'm in a terminal, and I'm going to type ls to list the current objects in the, in, the, in, the, in the directory I'm in. And as you can see, these correspond to all the same over here. And I'm going to, so we're going to load this mask use data, which is right here. And I'm just going to copy that and type head which just allows us to look at the first parts of the file. And as you can see, it looks like uh, the first row contains names, column names. Fantastic. Always good. And it looks like the columns are separated by comma. So this is the first column, comma. This is the second column, et cetera. So that's super important information. Uh, I'm going to go back to the console button here. This is just where the R code is run. Um, and today, uh, I'm going to actually just run my code. I'm not going to write it out for you guys uh, in the interest of moving quickly and also covering lots of content. So I'm going to run this code here, which is basically going to read in this file that's in the directory we're currently in using this read delim function. So delim is just short for delimited, which is basically, you know, what are your data separated by in your table? And we, we tell this function, our data are separated by commas. Another super common format would be if they're separated by tabs, which you would indicate by this. Um, uh, backslash T, which is kind of like a special character, uh, but our data are separated by commas. Okay, so let's highlight this and press run. And as you can see, in this window pane up here, some object was created. I'm going to click it. Uh, actually, I'm not going to click it. If you 
type the name of a variable uh, or the name of a data table and just press run, you can see it automatically prints the first, uh, it looks like 10 rows. And you can see this is a tibble. It has 3,000-ish something rows and six columns. This is great because if you look at the number of counties in the US, there's about 3,000. So this is kind of a nice sanity check to make sure our data look as we expect. And as you can see, it recognized where the various columns were. And, and just a brief background on this data, um, the New York Times asked a question to individual people in various counties, which are represented by these five digit numbers actually. A little annoying. I'd rather have their, uh, you know, their, their name, not their number, uh, but we'll change that. So the New York Times asked, how often do you wear a mask in public when you expect to be within six feet of another person? So these people said they never wear a mask when they're within six feet of another person. And this uh, proportion of people said that they always wear a mask. Uh, and again, when I download other people's data, I typically like to do many, uh, I call sanity checks on them to make sure that they make sense. Even if you trust your source, it's always good to verify. And so one little sanity check um, that came to my mind is these look like proportions or probabilities. You know, if, if you go to this county, what's the chance you encounter someone that reported they never wear a mask when they're within six feet of someone? And, probab and probabilities for a particular county, they, they should all sum to one. And so uh, I checked this very quickly by, uh, you know, so this is the mask use data table. I went to row one. So I specify rows before the comma and I specify columns after the comma. So columns two through, so the colon is through columns two through six. So for the first column here, I'm gonna sum because I'm using the sum function, I'm going to sum the first, uh, sorry, the, the, the columns two through six from this data table. So let's run these. And I'm going to repeat this process just for the first three rows again, just to get an idea. And as you can see, they're all, eh, they're all one-ish. Um, there might be some rounding error, but, but basically it looks like we can treat these proportions as probabilities. Okay, so this is a very important topic uh, regarding tidyverse, which is data that's in long format versus wide format. I'm going to quickly navigate over to the cheat sheet that I sent you guys uh, in my tab up here. And this is under the general topic of reshaping data. So, um, you know, long format and wide format are kind of just what they sound like. So here, this data table is in wide format. It's wider and I'll show you an example. And this data table is in long format and we can convert from wide to long or go back from long to long. Okay, so what is long format? Long format is also referred to tidy uh, and it's where every column is a variable and every row is an observation. So when we look at this mask data, which I'm going to do by, I'm going to click this over here, which will open up a tab in our studio that contains these mask data almost in Excel like format that we can quickly browse through. So let's just stare at this data and ask the question, uh, is each column its own variable? Um, so to me, it doesn't seem like that's the case. The most basic unit of analysis here is a person, a single person within a county, and this person was asked a question, and they replied one of five responses, never through uh, always. So basically, we could, you know, abstractly define a single categorical variable, which, you know, maybe we would put in another column, and we'll call it mask use response. And then underneath that column would be one of five values. This categorical variable mask use response can be one of five categories, never, rarely, sometimes, always, et cetera. And then, you know, we could have another column, which would be, you know, the proportions for each of those categories. 
So you know, mask use proportion would be another column over here that would take on these values. So this is basically converting from wide format. So wide format is where each of our columns is not its own variable. We're going to convert to long format where each column is its own variable. Um, and if this does not make sense, uh, after we convert, I will show you what the two data tables look like and I, I, I guarantee it will make a lot more sense. So again, so we're going to use, I'm going to go back to this cheat sheet here. We're going to use this gather function. Um, so a little annoying, these functions are rapidly evolving and gather is now called pivot wider. So we'll use that function instead. So we're going to go from wide format to long format with, with these data. Okay, so let's make a new tibble called mask use long, and we're going to assign it the following data. So we're going to use this pivot function, sorry, pivot longer function, and we're going to give pivot longer the following data, mask use, and we're, we want to tell pivot longer which columns to use in order to convert from wide format to long format. And I'm going to go back to the mask use data. We want, it, we want to tell it to use these columns here, never through always. We could spell out all of those, but alternatively, we could also just give it all of the columns we don't want. And since we only want it to not use one column, it's more simple to just type everything but, that's what this minus sign stands for, the county FP column. Okay, so it's gonna take all of those data in everything but the minus county FP column, so all of these response data, and it's going to create a new column called mask use response that takes on one of five values, never through always, and it's going to take another column, it's going to make another column called the mask use proportion, which are the numerical values for all of those different variables. And it's going to get rid of all of these columns that we no longer need in wide format. Okay. Also, I typed my code like this just to make it more readable. You could also have it such that all of this is specified on a single line, just like this. Um, but it's you know, technically a little more difficult to read, so we prefer typing it just like this. So let's run this code here. And as you can see, when we look at our mask use long table, we now see it's in long format. It has many, many more rows than it did before. And for each county, it's represented on five lines now because there are one of five ways people can respond to this mask use questionnaire. And then these are the proportions. So this is long format and this is wide format. Um, and if we want to convert you know, from long format back to wide format, which we don't need to here because our data is originally in this format, we can use uh, another function called pivot, uh, pivot wider, but we'll not cover that today. And I'd also like to make another note, which is that this long format is not in theory better than wide format. You're, you can analyze your data in any format possible. The data are the exact same in these two formats. They're just shaped differently. But there are some functions, some of which we'll explore next time, that specifically require us to use our data in long format. And so we can easily convert between them using these functions. And it makes certain analyses that would otherwise be very complicated to do uh, very, very simple. OK, so I'm going to get rid of these tables and go back to the R code. OK, so another. So oftentimes when we code in R, we want to do many things to our data back to back. So let's say we want to, um, we want to you know, make our data in long format. Uh, and then let's say we want to rename one of the columns. There was one column that you know, had county FP in it, but let's change it such that it's uh, FIPS, for instance, instead of county FP. And let's say we also want to um, arrange our table such that it's sorted by a particular value. We could sort it um, numerically based on county name. We don't have that, so we could 
uh, sort numerically on this county FIPS, this FIPS value instead. So we will do these three tasks. We'll, um, we'll convert our data to long format using this function. We'll rename our data and then sort our data. There are three ways to do this. One of them is uh, considered the best, but I just wanna show you all of the ways possible. We could do, we could do this. I'm not gonna run this code. I'll just highlight it and explain it. We could uh, you know, make our data in long format as we did before. So this, this code is exactly the same as we ran above. We're just making our data in long format. And then we use the rename function. We give it this data we previously made up here. And we say, make a new column called FIPS and have it store the data that is currently under the column called county FP. There, so then we would rename this column and we would store that in you know, a modified long format data set, okay? And then we give this rename data set to the arrange function and say, arrange function, take this data and arrange it uh, numerically according to this new column called FIPS. Perfectly fine way to do this, um, nothing inherently wrong. A second way to do this, uh, and please don't do this, would be to create a bunch of nested loops. So for instance, see here where we gave pivot longer this mask use data? Instead of giving it mask use, we could give it a renamed version of mask use by specifying it on the same line here and then feed that to an arrange function. Uh, this is extremely hard to read. There's too much going on in a single line. And although it's technically fine to do this, it's, it, it's more difficult to read both for your future self and for your collaborators. The third way of doing many commands back to back, again, if you just have a, several different cleaning operations you want to do, is uh, uh, the tidyverse way. This is kind of like the industry standard where we use these pipe operators to basically pass whatever is on the left to whatever is on the right. So this is similar to a pipe that's used in Unix. Um, so what we're doing here is we're taking the mask use data and we're passing it or piping it to the pivot longer function. This is doing the exact same stuff we just did above. It's just laid out slightly different. And again, is the easiest to read. And so we're, again, we're just gonna pivot longer based on the following parameters. One super interesting thing you'll notice is that with pivot longer, we're not, we're not telling it what data to use anymore. So up here, I told pivot longer, use the mask use data. Here, I'm not because mask use was piped to pivot longer. And so because pivot longer is preceded by this stuff, it knows that that's the data you want to modify. So we're gonna pivot longer and then whatever happens after this, we're going to pass to the rename function. Again, you'll see that we did not give the rename function the, data, the, the tibble because it knows what tibble to use. It's whatever's being passed to it. And then again, we're gonna pass this to the arrange function to sort by the FIPS value. So this code I'm actually going to run. And uh, if we look at our data table, by clicking it over here, you can see this column is now called uh, FIPS and it should be sorted by um, county number, this, this, this FIPS number, because we've used this arrange function and told it arrange the data by the FIPS value. Okay, so we have our mask data and we've polished it in the sense that we've renamed it and sorted it and we have it in both wide format and long format. You know, whatever, use whatever is most convenient for you. Although it's uh, preferred to store your data in long format if possible. Again, not necessary. So in addition to this mask data, um, let's load in some additional data uh, on COVID-19 case counts across the US. This is also supplied by the New York Times and we wanna combine it with the mask data. So unlike the previous mask data, which we specified a file name, here you can see we're actually specifying a URL address and we'll download this data directly to this 
uh, instance of RStudio that we're using. And again, these data are delimited by commas. So I was beforehand, always check what your data are delimited by uh, before you try to load them. And let's just, you know, after we load our data, let's just arrange it by the FIPS value. And we'll store all of this in a new tibble called cases. So I'm gonna run this code here and it, it ran successfully. And uh, I should see something pop up here. Not seeing anything yet. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Let me rerun that. Run. Oh, damn it. I mean, sorry, uh, I, I didn't highlight everything. So it made a tibble called aces. But uh, let, me, let me highlight all of it. So sorry, first let me, let me remove that function. Sorry, that, that object I just made. I'm gonna remove parentheses aces, that's nonsense. Uh, and let me highlight the whole thing this time and press run. And it's taking a little bit of time because this is a ton of data. There are, as you can see in this window pane up here, there are almost a half a million observations. And this is because this data has been collected for some counties ever since the beginning of January all the way until you know, August, which it is now. There are 3,000 counties represented here too. So, um, so tons of data. Um, we could analyze all these data, but just to kind of simplify things uh, and show you how to use a new tidyverse function, let's filter this data. Um, so I'm gonna actually, let's, let's quickly look at what these cases data look like. I'm just gonna type in the console down here, cases. And because cases is a tibble, when I type the name and press enter, it's only gonna display the top 10 lines, which is useful because this thing is 500,000 lines long-ish, and that would suck if it printed them all to screen. So again, for, so for March 24th, 2020, these are the case counts for uh, uh, Autauga, Alabama, et cetera. And this goes down and down and down. Let's say we only want to analyze data from a very specific date, maybe the most recent date, uh, just to you know, simplify things at first. We can do that using this filter function. Um, so you don't have to follow me, but I'm gonna quickly reference this cheat sheet over here. So again, if we look in this column, when we want to subset our data by rows or select specific rows, we can use this filter function. I'm gonna go back to the RStudio. And we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna make a new tibble called cases latest. Uh, and we're gonna try to filter based on August 3rd. That was when I was starting to create this workshop, but that's not the most latest date. You guys could go back and um, you know, analyze these data yourself using a newer date if you wish. So we're gonna take these cases data, which, we, which are too big, we're gonna pipe it to this filter function, and we're telling filter under the date column, which you can see is right here, if the value is equal to August 3rd, which we specify in quotes here, and notice the double equals, so it's a logical test, you know, does you know, the current date, it's gonna go through row by row, and it's gonna ask the question, does the current date equal this string we've given here? If so, take that row. And then again, let's just arrange it by FIPS value. So you can see these data on case counts, not only do they have a county name, but they also have this, this FIPS number that was present in the mask data, which is very important, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Okay, so let's run this and make a new tibble called cases latest, uh, and I'll try to do it correctly this time. And if I go up to my environment here, which has all of our objects, uh, cases latest, this is what we just created. Perfect. As you can see, it has 3,000 observations. That's much smaller than the, the previous one. And if I click on it, just to view it, uh, you can see the date column is only equal to August 3rd, fantastic. So basically now we have data for all of these 3,000 counties in the US for the specific date of August 3rd. Okay. Uh, okay, so next we're gonna combine these two data sets that we just downloaded for the following reason. So I'm gonna look at, um, 
um, mask use long, oh, which I already have, and then, and then cases like this. So one annoying thing about the mask use data set is these, these counties aren't, they don't have names. I don't know what county 01001 is. But if we look at the cases data set, not only does it have this number, it also has the county name. So basically, if we were to com if we were to combine these two data sets together, then we can basically add the mask use data to the end of these cases data. We can match them by their FIPS county number, such that we can basically uh, we can basically assign an actual county name to these data, not some numerical code. So we'll use the join function and we'll tell the join function combine these two data sets, but in particular, focus on this column, FIPS. And so, and, and for these two data sets, anytime you see data where uh, rows share the same FIPS column, use that criteria to combine them. So again, it's gonna take this case count data, and because it's 01001 here, and going to the mask use data, it matches these rows here. It's basically gonna take this data and assign it to this row here. So that's what we're, that's what the goal is right now. But um, let's, let, let, so which join function do we use? So I do this all the time. I type in the console, I'm down here now, I type question mark. And if you type question mark join, a lot of times you have to type the exact same name of the function. But for these join functions, there's actually four of them. And if you press just question mark join, this very useful help window uh, pops up. And so there are four different kinds of join functions we can use. And basically these treat missing data um, differently. So for instance, what if, I'm gonna go back to our data sets. What if, what if Autauga, just by chance, it didn't have a FIPS value, it just had NA. Whereas the mask use data, let's say it did have a FIPS value. Therefore, when we try to combine these data sets, one table has a value that the other one doesn't, a value that we're trying to match them by. Um, so inner join basically includes all rows in X and Y. So the, the first data set, X, and the second data set, Y. So here we're combining two data sets. If any of these rows, sorry, if any of these data tables is missing the value that we're trying to match our data sets by, FIPS, it just, it just throws them out. Inner join is the most conservative. It only keeps rows with uh, data present in both data sets. And then left join, for instance, it prioritizes the rows in the first data set that you use. Um, so for instance, let's say in cases, let's say, um, let's say this was missing a value here. It was missing its FIPS value, but we still wanted to keep this if we combined it with left join, it would basically produce a bunch of NAs for the mask data. Okay, so let's do another little sanity check on these data. And again, sanity checks are always good uh, before you use a function so that you kind of know what to expect. So what do the data look like in these tibbles? So let's create, um, so let's take cases latest and we're gonna pass it to this filter function where we're basically going to ask, okay, filter function, look at the FIPS column and only return rows that have missing values, is.na. NA is typically what's used for uh, missing values. And then we're gonna take that and we're gonna pass that to n rows, which is some function that just counts the number of rows. So we're gonna take our table, filter it, and if this is something greater than zero, then that means there are rows that have missing FIPS values. And we'll do the exact same for the mask use long data. Let's run this code. And we'll go down to the console here. So as you can see, the cases data are actually missing 29 rows. Uh, sorry, let me repeat that. There are 29 rows in the case count data where the FIPS values are missing. This potentially could be problematic, but let's just hold off on that. Uh, whereas the mask use data, every single row has a FIPS value. So to inspect whether or not we care 
about these missing values in the case count data, let's, let's make a new table called cases underscore MAs. So it's the missing values in the cases data set. We'll take the cases data set. Again, we're going to run the same code up here. We're going to pipe it to this filter function that's going to select for the rows that have missing FIPS values based on, uh, based on this here. And let's just sort them. I'm going to run this code. And if we look at cases, MAs, I'm going to click it over here. Let me get rid of these other ones first. Um, okay, so it looks like a bunch of these counties actually have unknown names. Um, I don't really care. I'm happy potentially excluding them, which we would ex which would happen if we use the inner join function. But if we scroll down, uh, this is a huge problem. So New York City is missing a FIPS value. So if we just used one of these filter functions and it uh, threw out those that had missing values, it would have thrown out New York City, which in this particular context is pretty important. I mean, it has the highest case count. I mean, the, the number of cases per day is less, but overall the highest human case count. Uh, and it'd be nice to compare other counties to New York because I feel like in our head, we all kind of have a better understanding of what the situation was like in New York. Okay, so we're going to use the mutate function. The mutate function in tidyverse is used to add new columns, but it's also used to change existing columns. And this, so I, I, I came up with this last night. It's a little complicated, um, but it, it, it shows it shows the power of uh, basically selecting specific rows just to rename. So I looked up the FIPS value for New York and I want to change just the row where the county is equal to New York City. And if that's true, give it this value. If it's false, just keep the regular, uh, keep the, the FIPS value that already exists there. Okay, so let me, let me just explain this again because this is a little complicated. We're going to take our cases latest data and we're going to reassign it. So we're going to overwrite it and we're going to pass it to this mutate function. And mutate is going to look at the FIPS column and it's going to reassign the FIPS column the following data. It's going to go through each row and it's going to conduct this uh, if else test. So this is why it gets a little tricky here. If else. Okay, so what it's going to do is, is if you, let, let me back up for a second. I'm going to go down to the console. I'm going to type question mark. If anything confuses you, always try to do this. I'm going to type if underscore else and press enter. And we can look at the, the help page for this. And if else is, uh, so it's a tidyverse function in, in dplyr. dplyr is one of the packages in tidyverse. So if else, it takes a condition. And then if that condition is true, it does something, and if it's false, it does something else. So what's happening here is if else is taking a condition, we're asking in the, in the column that's named county, does it equal to New York City? If that's true, give that cell this value. If it's not true, if it's at a row where uh, it's a different county, just give it the, the FIPS value, give it the value that it previously had in that column. Um, anyways, so this is just to demonstrate how you can use pretty complicated code to go in and modify specific values. But what's beautiful about this is you also have a record of exactly how you modified your raw data set, which is good, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, just saying in the method section of some paper that, you know, you modified the data. Here you said you used the raw data set and cleaned it using this function. Um, also, if there were many, many, many rows with New York City and missing values, it would be a huge pain to go through and modify all of those by hand, whereas this just recursively goes through your data set and modifies all of it. Okay, so let's run this code and this should change those cells, the fixed cells, that have New York City. And um, let's, just, let's just make sure that worked. So I'm gonna click on the cases latest data. 
uh, we could use the filter function and filter for the county is equal to New York City. If your data set's not too large, you can also just do this. You can enter in the search bar up here, New York City, boom. As you can see, it no longer has a missing value. So that worked. Uh, always nice to check to make sure your code works. Okay, so now that we have our data and we've modified it a little bit, but we have record of exactly how we modified it, let's finally join the cases data and the masks data. So to do that, we're gonna use the inner join function. Again, inner join only keeps rows in both data tables where they both have uh, a fixed value. The first data set we're gonna give it is cases latest. So again, these are just the cases for August 3rd. The second data set we're gonna give it is the mask use data in long format. And this is super important right here. We're telling interjoin in these two data sets, there's a column called FIPS. Join these two data based on the values in that column. Um, it's also possible that you're trying to combine two data sets where they have, there's a column that has the same data, but they're named differently. Um, so for instance, at the very beginning, our mask use data had a column that was called like County FP. Uh, I renamed the column. Another alternative would be is you don't rename the column, you just keep it. And you, for this by argument here, you can just type C, you can give it two values. So C is just combined. Um, we're going to give it two values, uh, FIPS, uh, Actually, 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 I'm blanking on the syntax here. Uh, um, I'm blanking on the syntax. I forgot if it's, you know, if it's like this, county, FP, uh, if it's like this, or if it's something like uh, a logical test. Anyways, I apologize. But the easier way is to just rename the column in both data sets so that they match. And that's what we'll do here. Okay, so let's run this function. And as you can see, let, let's just take a brief look at it just to make sure. So we've had this, we have this new table now that combined the cases data and the mask data. I'm gonna click on it. And as you can see, for each county, we not only have cases, deaths, we also have this new data that the New York Times produced about how frequently people are wearing masks. Um, one awkward thing is if we go back and open our cases data, for each county, there was only one row. For a single date, there was only one estimate of cases, for instance. But if you look at these combined data, now for that same county, it's represented on five different rows and the cases are duplicated because it basically had to account for the fact that the mask use response data for this particular county, it had five separate rows. And so in order to combine these data sets, it actually had to duplicate data. This is not a problem, um, but it's something that is good to be uh, aware of. And as you analyze your data, you know, to remind yourself that some of these values might be duplicated. Okay. Um, Let's see, I think we're... Okay, and just to illustrate the use of a couple uh, new functions, let me go back to this. So I'm, I'm right here. So uh, there is some, so the date column now, uh, because we filtered cases latest to only have the same date, it has the same value for each row. So this is no longer really informative. So we could potentially remove this row if we wanted to. Um, sorry, column. We could remove this column date. We could also remove this FIPS column if we want, because to be honest, all I really want is the county name. I don't really know what these FIPS values are. Um, okay, so we will use the select function to select particular columns based on their name the filter function selected rows, select, selects columns. And I'm gonna go back over to this cheat sheet really quickly, you don't have to follow me. And so basically that's 
subsetting variables or subsetting columns. And that's done with this select function. So here they selected these three columns in blue and made a smaller tibble with fewer columns. So we're going to do just that. What we're going to do is we are going to take our cases masks data and we're going to overwrite it because of this assignment operator. And we're going to pipe cases mask to this select function. And we're going to tell the select function, I want everything but the date column and everything but the FIPS column. Um, ignore this here. I left that in there. Um, but let me make a, let me make a quick yeah okay, let me make a quick comment. Um, Tidyverse has some functions that have common names like select. There are other packages in R that have nothing to do with Tidyverse, and they also have their own functions named select. So if you have both of these packages uh, loaded at the same time and you say select. R might not know which select function you're referring to. Are you referring to the tidyverse one or this other package that also has a select function? Um, as I was writing this workshop, I actually encountered this problem and I had this weird error message where basically it said select can't take a tibble. And I know that's nonsense because select was made to take tibbles, you know, because we're feeding it this tibble here. And so what I did is you can use this colon colon syntax, which is kind of, it, it's like using a namespace where we're basically saying from this package, use this function. So we can specify the exact package we want to use um, when we use a particular function. In this case, because in this environment I created for us, there are no conflict, there are no conflicting packages. I believe we can get rid of this and just type and just run this code. So anyways, uh, but know, know that this exists. It could, help, uh, it could help prevent some crazy error messages. OK, we now have done uh, uh, an admittedly boring task of downloading our data, filtering it, cleaning it, combining it, et cetera. It's boring, but it's something that has to be done, just like pipetting has to be done for wet lab biologists. And it's good to know these functions and to do this quickly because if, uh, if, if, you, you know, if you do this inefficiently, it could take tons of time. Um, you know, 80% of the time of a project could be spent cleaning data, which is super boring. But now we can actually analyze these data. Um, very, very simply. We're only going to just scratch the surface. And again, none of us are epidemiologists. Please. Uh, pay attention to whatever the public health officials are saying. But we can get a brief glimpse at what these data look like um, using tidyverse functions. And again, this is one of the quickest ways to um, kind of explore your data. Okay, so let's ask the questions, which counties use masks the least frequently? So to answer this question, I took our cases mask data. Again, I'm just going to a bit, a, uh, oops, I don't know what that is. I'll click it again. This is our cases mass data. Um, let's pass it to the filter function such that we only look at rows where the mass use counts is never, because I want to see I want to see the counties that are uh, you know never wearing with with the most people that are never wearing masks. So basically, I'm only going to select this column and this column, etc. Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry. 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 Okay. So filter based on this value in this column, and then pipe that to the arrange function. And let's arrange it such that we're going to sort our data by mask use proportion. So uh, I'm going to go back to our data set. We're going to sort it by this column here. Oh, but sort. Uh, sorry. But the arrange function it sorts your data in um, increasing order or ascending order from low to high. But I want to go from high to low. I, so I tell a range that I want to sort by descending order. So the highest is on the top and the lowest is on the bottom. And if there are any counties that have the same proportion, so let's say two counties have 0.33. Uh, so how do, I, how do I want to break ties? I give it another column to sort by. So I tell it just sort by the, um, the, the 
the name of the county. And so this is going to make a tibble, and I'm going to pipe that to the head function. So head only looks at a certain, a certain number of beginning rows in your tibble, and I say n equals 10. Give me the first 10 lines. So, so uh, just you know, in language, what's happening here is I'm going to take all of the columns where um, we have data for people replying never. I'm going to sort them such that the ones where people replied never the most are on top. And I'm going to look at the top 10. Let's run this. I'm excited. OK, so first of all, these numbers, well, first of all, these numbers are unacceptable. They should be zero. Everyone should be wearing masks based on careful studies. Um, but I, I, I would think these numbers would actually be a little bit higher. I would think there might be counties where people like, like just never wear masks. But it looks like only 40% never wear masks when they're within six feet of each other. And what are these counties? Um, no pointing fingers. Um, we're not experts here. Uh, but it looks like you know, Utah, Missouri, Iowa. And if you look at the, if you look at the case counts, they're all lower, you know, like, like New York City isn't in here. So, you know, um, pure speculation, maybe people aren't wearing masks because they don't think that this is a risk in their county because there have been few cases and like zero deaths. Okay. So anyways, a super simple way to quickly ask, uh, you know, an, a, an important question. Okay, let's, um, let's ask a slightly uh, different question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I actually skipped, I skipped this one here. So this is a very similar question, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it to an hour, I'll finish it very soon. So instead of filtering on never, let's filter on always. So let's look at all the rows where the uh, re respondents replied that they always wear masks and do the same thing. Sort by the value in the proportion, and let's look at the top, the top 10. So I'm going to just run this. So again, if you, if you look at these two pieces of code, they're the exact same, except I am now looking at the always response. What do these look like? Um, OK, there's one county in California which also has super few cases and quite few deaths, but everyone's still wearing masks. Uh, kind of interesting. One observation I had, uh, and again, these are all just pure descriptions. I'm not trying to paint any trends whatsoever because I am not a public health official. But all of these states look like they are states that somewhere in that state, they had a city that may have been hugely impacted, such that maybe these smaller counties nearby are still frequently wearing masks. Pure speculation. Um, that's a hypothesis we might be able to test. And you know, now we can test this based on these preliminary exploring of our data. Um, OK, last, last little question we'll ask is, for the counties that had the most cases, you know, New York City comes to mind, for instance, how frequently are people always wearing masks? And one thing I would like to say is that this survey of mask wearing was done in early July, so pretty recently and pretty late in the, in the pandemic. So to ask this question, I'm going to do the following, uh, which looks very similar again to the code above. I'm going to take our cases, masks, data set, our data set that we've cleaned, and I again only look at the always column because I'm interested in, in how frequently, what proportion of people are always wearing masks in the counties that had the most cases. So to, to get the counties with the most cases, instead of arranging by the mask use proportion, as we did up here, we can just arrange by the cases column instead in descending order. So the highest will be on the top, lowest on the bottom. And because the highest is on the top, if we take the top 10, we'll get the top 10 counties that have the highest case counts, because that's how we're sorting by. And then we can look at how frequently they were always wearing masks. Okay, let's run this code. And as you can see, um, so New York City is right on top and it looks like 80% of the time, when someone is within six feet of someone, they're always wearing a mask. Um, that should be one, should be 100%. Uh, uh, but, but what's also interesting is that there are, there are smaller counties that have higher values, which, you know, 
could be statistical noise, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, and one thing that uh, struck me is how similar the case counts in Los Angeles are to the case, the, the, the cumulative case counts in New York. So these are all the COVID infections ever detected in New York. These are all the COVID infections ever detected in LA. Uh, these numbers are quite similar, more similar than I expected. I mean, I know it's been in the news, et cetera, but um, that was just one thing that surprised me. And again, this highlights the importance of going into our data and um, inserting the value, the FIPS value for New York, such that we could include it in this uh, analysis so that we could use it as a comparison. Also, there are places in Florida and Arizona that have approximately half the number of cases that were documented in New York, uh, which again was a little surprising. Okay, so that's all I have. I went slightly over, um, but, but just before you leave, uh, for the sake of uh, solidifying things in memory. Let's just, let's just quickly summarize things. Um, so we've used some key tidyverse functions today. Uh, first, we used read to lim, which reads in a file, and it automatically converts it to a tibble, which is super nice. And tibbles are used by all of these tidyverse functions that we use today. Um, if we want to transform our data from long format to wide format, we can use these pivot longer and pivot wider functions. Just, just a really quick review. If you know, I never remember what data to give these functions. And if you just type question mark pivot longer and press enter, I use this all the time. You know, it'll give a quick description. It's like, okay, I need to give pivot longer data. I need to give it the columns I want to use, names to, and values to. So this is a quick way to, you know, you don't need to memorize all this stuff. Just know that you can type question mark and uh, and, and and check which arguments, data, columns, that pivot longer needs. Again, you don't need your data in long format, but there are some situations where it uh, makes analyses super convenient. We've used a rename function to rename particular columns. The arrange function was used to sort our tibble based on column. You know, we just we give it a column name and it sorts the, the, the table, the tibble, based on that column. The filter function was used to select rows that met particular conditions. For instance, county equals New York City or something like that. The mutate function was used to, it's used to add columns, but it can also be used to modify existing columns. So we use the mutate function to modify the FIPS column to insert a particular value. And last but not least, we use the select function, which is kind of like the, the, the opposite of filter in where we select columns to keep as opposed to filter, which selects rows. Um, and again, please reference this cheat sheet. Don't necessarily focus on memorizing all these things um, because you can kind of get quickly by, you can get to where you need to go quickly by just looking back at this cheat sheet and again, using these in-house help functions to get an idea of which arguments you need to pass to these functions. Okay, next time we will combine these data with yet another data set on county population sizes to kind of get an idea of how these trends vary by the size of the county. Um, and, and yeah. That's all. Um, I am happy to stick around for a little bit to answer any questions. And you can also email me anytime about any of this at uh, brnold at g.harvard.edu. Uh, anytime with any questions about this content or, or any other R content, really. Cool. And that's all. I'll stop recording. And again, yeah, happy to hang around for a little bit.